Welcome to the COSIN Podcast, bringing you timely insights and strategies to succeed in the ever-evolving world of school system technology. I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger. Each month, you'll hear from consortium for school networking experts, visionary technology leaders, entrepreneurs, and practitioners who will discuss the topics most essential to every school and district technology leader. And now, enjoy today's episode. I'm looking forward to this conversation. We're, we're spending some time today with Donna Williamson, Karen Dobda, and Steve Tomaszewski uh, to talk about uh, COSIN's early career K-12 CTO Academy program, and then <laughs> all things uh, CTO uh, in the world of being a CTO. And I'm glad we're the three of us, or the four of us, I should say, um, are spending some time together because I think it seems, and I want to get your perspective, that technology has really evolved in the space of public education, the way in which we think about the talent that we need to support um, technology efforts within schools and school systems and the very people that are driving those. Donna, I want to start with you. Can you give some background on COSIN's early career K-12 CTO Academy program? Uh, Yes, I can. Um, Having been on the board with COSIN for about seven years, we were very focused on the um, CETL certification. And over time, with uh, especially with our emerging leaders, we realized that there was a gap for those CTOs that had uh, just gotten on the you know, their position or had been in the position for four years or less. And so at that time, in partnership with Dell, we started looking at, while well, we still follow the framework of essential skills, where that was very strategic, we wanted to be a little more tactical. Uh, and what we were learning was um, all the CTOs that are coming from um, maybe the classroom or another position or corporate IT, that transition into the CTO for K-12 was um, was very daunting. So at that point, we started working on the modules and things. Uh, we did focus groups with superintendents, chief academic officers, uh, veteran CTOs, to try to say, what is it that you think that these early career CTOs uh, need to know. And that's kind of how it was born. Karen, I want to turn to you. Will you talk a little bit about just your perspective in your role and, and speaking to what Don is talking about, sort of the gap in, in both knowledge, experience, and application and trying to then fill that need by understanding sort of what's going on in the market and the need? Well, I think what Donna said is really kind of applicable to me in my situation because I started as a classroom teacher nearly 30 years ago. And then um, I then became a professional development coordinator in the school district I was in at the time during their one-to-one technology initiative rollout. And so that's where I really got the interest in everything related to educational technology, how it worked, how to make it work for teachers and kids, how to make it really work in the classroom. And then um, when this position opened, the position I'm in now, it was just a natural next step. So knowing that I understood the classroom aspect and how everything worked in the classroom, what this program's really done for me is helped me find resources and people more on the the technical side of it, the behind the scenes side of it that I really wasn't as knowledgeable about. Do you think that this is also a nice, uh, it's the timing is good, Karen, because just sort of that, the timeline that you laid out there in your experience is that if I'm a parent in that district, then I am just, <laughs> I'm, I'm really fortunate that you maybe by accident or happy accident sort of had this Plinko kind of, a, <laughs> you know, experience where you didn't realize you're going to end up where you are now, but all of them stacked up together were cumulative in your experience and knowledge that then made you a nice fit in that regard. How do we avoid not just having accidental leaders that are, you know, just by pure happenstance that are landing in our, in our districts? I think in, in my role, and I think definitely being in the classroom really helped me understand the needs of students, developmentally needs of students at different levels, um, always communicating with parents about what they're concerned about with students. And then also I think too is helping teachers to understand and communicate that as well to parents when they're you know, having conferences with them and those types of things about how education and technology really go hand in hand to work together to help kids become more engaged and access more resources in the classroom. I think having a blend of someone that understands the education side of the house, but yet also having someone understanding the IT side of the house really work together, that's really a perfect blend for any school district and really 
kind of helps us in our position. I think what you're saying there, it also supports the understanding of the type of talent we need to be not only fostering, but also looking for in the generations to come of future CTOs in that regard. Steve, I know that you are, (laughs) I'm sure this is public knowledge to everyone in your community, but you're a very avid baseball fan. Um, (laughs) um, And I think what's interesting when we look at technology, obviously in the news for those that follow sports and baseball is, you know, we've had an, uh, it might be called an incredible sort of controversy with uh, the former World Series champs, the Houston Astros, and sort of how technology can run amok. Um, when we get excited about what we think we can do and we apply it in ways that may not be uh, the original intention. With that as the backdrop, how do we in education provide the guardrails that we think we need from a safety perspective while not limiting that innovative spirit in schools, that iterative approach to technology? How do we do that and yet still maintain a, a protectionist model because we are dealing with young people uh, that are influenced in ways that that maybe we aren't as as adults just by age and wisdom, hopefully. <laughs> you know, that, it's a tough question because I was also a classroom teacher for almost 20 years. And when I, when I came into this role, I, I thought the first thing I'm not going to do is let IT stand in the way of education because that was always one of the roadblocks that I had always seen. And I was like, okay, we're not going to do that. And then you get in the position and you find out how big the scope is and what you're responsible for, and you start to go, oh, goodness. And so you start to reach out to find out what are people doing. And, and then you have to have a lot of tough conversations with principals and administrators to say, hey, you know, if we want our kids, they're going to make mistakes. And if they make mistakes, at least here in this realm, they're a little more protected and we can help them learn from it that hopefully later on in life they don't make those same mistakes. But we go through a lot of mistakes with the kids, but that doesn't mean we shut it off. And I always try to remind everybody that the good outweighs the bad, that sure, we can ban cell phones and we can turn Twitter off. We can do all those things, but they're they're great tools. Um, We just have to show them how to use them correctly because I don't know if all adults even know how to use them correctly. And so if we're not modeling every single day what we want them to do, it doesn't work. And then we also have to tell the kids that we've messed up too. And and I'll tell the kids all the time, thank goodness we didn't have smartphones when I was in high school or I probably wouldn't get to talk to you. And so we want to make sure that we're, I'll go into classrooms all the time and I'll talk to the kids about, you know, the digital citizenship, they're grabbing onto some of that. And it's the same thing with, with our adults is, is we've just got to make sure that we're all kind of on that same path. You know, I, Don, I want to, if we go to sort of 10,000 feet, you know, if we, if we look at the real estate industry, if you, if you want to sell a new house and a new development, you stage that house, right? Because you think that if you, if you put furniture in a certain light and a certain perspective and sequence that there's going to be a buyer or groups of buyers that say, I could see myself there. When we think about sort of the work of COSIN and, and developing this academy program, how do, how do you understand the narrative to attract the talent to engage in a conversation where they're ready and prepped and excited because it is kind of a whole new world, right? It is a little bit of the Wild West as we're very quickly trying to iterate through that and be as prepared as possible for those conversations that Steve's talking about when you're in the classroom with students and other teachers. You know, I think it starts with the superintendent and the board and recognizing that when they're hiring this person, uh, this person doesn't is, is more than just a techie. It's more than just someone uh, that's going to provide, you know, integration ideas and, and PD for teachers. Um, so I think it starts with the superintendent, and we've had a lot of really rich conversations with superintendents. Um, I've been very fortunate to uh, be on a lot of hiring committees uh, with superintendents um, and, and ask, actually looking and having an opportunity to talk to them because what they – you know, what they really need is someone that has phenomenal leadership skills um, and that have the potential to be a great leader. I understand that when you're, like you said, out there at, at 10,000 feet, the person that you hire may not have had the opportunity to be a great leader. And that was one of the reasons why when Keith called me about the academy, I, I was just thrilled because I've seen that over and over again, you know, with mentoring different um, CTOs in the state. And so, you know, they've got to look for people who have the potential to be great leaders. Um, they have to have somebody that's passionate 
about education. And like Steve said, somebody that's um, not a naysayer. And one of the other things is someone that you can, you know, you can tell when you're talking to them that it's not about them, that they have a very servant leadership, you know, mentality and that they want to look at the school district and the kids and the families and the communities involved and, you know, have a, just a real passion for following the vision in, of the school district, not their personal vision, but the vision of the school district. And I think that is key. Um, I always tell people, you know, if they have an affinity for technology, I can train them the technical skills. If they, if they have, I've had people that have never been in education, that they have a real um, uh, heart for education and people. Uh, you know, I can teach them the other pieces, but if they don't have that um, ability bec to become a leader, uh, they, they generally don't rise to the level that, that most school districts would really like for them to be. You're listening to the COSIN Podcast, produced in partnership with Mind Rocket Media Group. If you're a K-12 ed tech leader, product or service provider, or a school or district leader looking for support with your communications, public relations, social media, and multimedia production efforts, visit mindrocketmediagroup.com to learn how you can work together with the expert team at MindRocket to achieve your goals. Steve, so I've had on, on many occasions talking with directors of technology over the last 10 years, comments made, and I think we're seeing an evolution. I'd love your perspective on this, where even, you know, eight to 10 years ago, you would be told that a, techno a given technology director was a, they were associated with a certain technology brand, right? Like that was what they went with. That's what they, <laughs> regardless of, you know, um, kind of where that company or brand, you know, where it was it's standing or sort of, um, you know, perceived success in a classroom, they were stuck on that. Um, it seemed to be much more personally driven um, like you might say that, you know, personally, I'm an iPod, an iPhone guy or you're a Samsung or, you know, these sorts of things. And I think that that sent a message to the ecosystem within a school that was less than collaborative. Have you seen a change in that with your colleagues? <laughs> it's funny because I walked into that same situation here where everybody, two of the schools, three of the schools are all Mac. And that's just what they were. And so now as we're putting in a refresh cycle and going to an operational type of budget, you know, I'm showing them all the pieces. These are the costs. This is what things are going to be over the lifespan. And people are going, but I like Max. And then when I say, well, tell me why, why do you need that? And so these are my, my teaching colleagues. And then they'll say, well, because it has more power. Well, what does that mean? And so, you know, there's a, there's an attachment, an emotional attachment. And so I even see it with my technicians is they're like, well, I only like to work on this kind of machine. I'm like, well, it's a machine, it's a PC. And they're like, well, it doesn't matter. I only know I like to work in there. So there's still a lot of that. And it's how to break that, that a machine does what we need it to do. You know, we want it to be sturdy. We want it to be effective. We want it to do what we need it to do in the classroom. But that whole emotional attachment to me is still kind of strange and crazy because we should be able to use anything in today's world. It shouldn't make much of a difference as long as it meets the needs of our students. Yeah, being agnostic. Karen, what, given what Steve just shared, I mean, what role, given your background with professional development, do you think PD plays in, in just staying just a step ahead so that we understand the implications of subtle communication like that to a world of student that is agnostic in their technology preferences? right? And it's ubiquitous to their lives. How do we stay just ahead, right, on the fringe from an adult, a professional perspective in training and informing on sort of what's new so that we are asking these key questions like Steve is talking about? I think professional development is key in anything. I mean, you know, we are in the teaching and learning business. That's what we do. And so, um, as teachers and as educators, we need to keep learning, need to keep growing because we want to model that behavior for our students. So I think, you know, providing that professional development, that just in time, um, have that just in time be, be able to come into a, a classroom or be able to kind of help a teacher plan and see something new or to see that spark in a student when they, they get a new skill or they learn something in a different way, I think is critical. And that's what keeps us, keeps us motivating and keeps us going. Um, you know, everything that Steve had said about, you know, just kind of 
teachers get attached to different devices. And in my own district right now, we just did a device refresh over the summer for students in grades six through 12. And we went from a type of PC or um, environment to really now a mobile device. We went, we went to iPads and um, I've seen that, that connection. I've seen that, but this is what we've always had. And then as we, we start transitioning, it was really important for me right out of the gate to say, yes, you can still do some of these things that you've done, but here's how we can move forward. Here's how we can really help our students to try new things because they're going to see us trying new things as well. What is the one thing, what I love about communities of practice in general, and we think about the cohort, right? I, I think that the ability to share with colleagues that have, they're, they're either in similar circumstances or they can relate quite quickly to circumstances that a given person is going through professionally. And there's a lot of learning that can go in, in professional development. What's the one, if, if there was one or two, you know, items that you just say, we've got to solve that. This is a conundrum in our profession that we don't often talk about, but my goodness, it pops up on a Monday. I see it again on a Wednesday and I see it on Friday. Um, and if, if we could have conversations about this one element, what might that be? That, that's a really, really good question. That's a really tough question. As, as I kind of think about, reflect on myself and then re reflect on my career and different things that I have seen, I think sometimes it's really that just willingness to try something new, to be able to kind of take that step and, you know, fail forward, as you say. If, um, you know, if something doesn't work out, it's okay that the kids see you struggle a little bit and how you persevere and, and you struggle through that. Um, you know, I've been to conferences where I've seen the speaker, you know, all with a presentation and then, you know, the technology doesn't work and how that, I recognize that, yep, it happens to all of us. And so really helping us to, it's, it's a learning community in the classroom. And sometimes the students will be the first one to jump up and say, hey, I know how to fix this or I know what to do. And that's okay. And just kind of make, keep that learning community moving forward. Steve, how about for you? For what, I, if you could solve communication, <laughs> um, that's what, what I find and whether it's me communicating out or administration or teachers or even students, it seems to come up all the time and whether it's, this is the process we, how we do something, this is the procedure on how we do something, that communication piece where I'll say something and three different people heard three different things. And so it's that clarification because that happens on a Monday and it happens on a Wednesday and on a Friday when something happens, they're like, well, we didn't know about that. And so it's also how to get people to understand that technology is just as important as everything else that's going on throughout the day because no one gets upset at me when everything works but they get upset with me when all of a sudden the phones don't work and, and so it's how to have those pieces that this is what happens when the phones don't work this is everybody knows what that is and that's that's different that's not everybody everybody's not used to that do you think and, and I'll speak just I'll, I'll, I'll take ownership of this perspective and, and please, Steve, you know, knock it down if you see fit. But I wonder if when we talk about the challenge of messaging is really what you're alluding to in that regard is that sometimes I think we miss an opportunity to understand the recipient of that message and the, the implication on their value or their perceived value in that equation. So if we're in, if we're adding technology and we're taking people that were maybe in media library, you know, uh, library specialty, right? And they're now a tech director. We're sort of pulling all these different groups of people and backgrounds that it can, the ground underneath can feel a little unsettling. And then when we start to implement, right, new things that if we're not taking into consideration the recipient of the message and the directive, they might be wondering, well, what value do I provide in that? And we see at a larger scale, you know, that discussion around teachers being facilitators and whether or not that's appropriate and then our discussion and labeling of the experience in the profession. Do you think that plays a role that we just sort of go straight forward and we look tactically at what needs to be done and we don't think about how that might impact a Karen or a Donna? I, I do. I was able to learn a few years ago before I took this role that if you decide to move too fast, you might, you might turn around as pitchforks. And so what you want to make sure is who's following you. Does everybody get in that same message? So that way, when you get to a point of making a change that people are like, yeah, I get that. I understand the why. And they understand, you know, that this is to make a better, what we're trying to do better. But I think a lot of times I learned that, that if you run too fast before you understand your environment, it usually doesn't end well. And it ended well, don't get me wrong, but I learned from my mistakes. And so on this time, 
in this role, you know, I was like, okay, well, understand the culture, understand the history, understand that whole piece first, get people to know you. And so that way they're, they're okay with approaching you, that they see you and they say, hey, do you got a second? And that they're comfortable with that versus just being a guy in a, in a, with a tie on walking around. And that was a big drive for my first year was get to know people, ask them the questions. And that was important. So when I do ask them, I get real feedback, not the feedback they think I want. Yeah. Karen, have, did you, I mean, do you lean into that with your background, classroom, PD, when you think about it now that you're in a position where you may be discussing an implementation and there could be sort of perceived collateral damage on how that might impact me in my classroom? Yeah, I definitely agree with what Steve is saying about relationships are key. Um, if you know, you don't know your people, you don't know the culture, you don't, they don't know you, that's definitely going to be a barrier as you're, you know, moving forward and making changes and maybe having to implement or do some things that yes, might impact me in my classroom. So relationships are definitely key in building those and that open, honest communication and setting that groundwork that it's important that we talk about you know, the, the issues and concerns and questions right up front and have that time. Um, it's not uncommon for me to stop in if I know the high school staff or the middle school staff is having a staff meeting or a team meeting and I'm available, let the principal know, hey, I'm available to, you know, can I come in? Just kind of, you know, get some feel, feedback and get a feel for how things are going. Um, that goes a long way and, and, you know, sending thank you notes and emails and just, you um, when you see teachers doing something really great in the classroom, whether it's technology related or not, that goes a long way. Donna, how do you hear what you're, you know, when, when Karen and Steve are talking about this, it's sort of that, it's that interpersonal sort of experience, right? Where I understand my value in relation to you and vice versa. How does that impact your thinking with regards to the cohort? And we're thinking about early career K-12 CTOs and the, the elements that they need that go beyond maybe the tactical elements of implementation. Well, you know, I think one is is one of the modules that we actually do is called communication, and it's it's not it's not just how to communicate. It's understanding that you know if you're in a K twelve uh, environment, you may have you know staff that you're communicating with and parents, and they range anywhere from twenty one to seventy. And if you you know if you look at how those different people like to to be you know communicated to, you know you kind of have to hit it from every every way and you know one of the other things we talk about um, and I know that I'm adding activities more activities for next year um, uh, we've extended the length of the time of the Academy to make sure that we have some time to really do that um, is you know just uh, not only looking at how you communicate and understanding that their day is so packed and you almost have to always start about how this is going to impact someone and um, and then things like, you know, how do you manage change? Um, respecting the legacy. Uh, I, you know, I was coaching somebody the other day and, and they came into a new environment. And I think Steve and Karen would say that one of the challenges now for new CTOs is that, like when I started, I was always the first one ever hired in the district. So I always hired my own staff. I didn't have to follow anybody, anybody but they do. And so they have to come in and while balancing a respect for the legacy because half the people that are in their department probably had a part of that, but yet also building that trust and those relationships. So we do spend some time on that and, and we'll continue to spend more time on that. And I think they would tell you that, you know, even just looking at the coast and connect that we established for them, I've, I've just been thrilled at them talking to each other and learning from each other. And that's just another way of communicating and getting ideas. Well, I think it's fair to say that the learning has just begun and it's, it's thoughtful conversation and contribution and legacies like the three of you bring to the table that I think advance that conversation. It can be very valuable to, uh, to the COSIN's Early Career K-12 CTO Academy. We want to thank Donna Williamson, Karen Dobda, and Steve Tomaszewski. I'm Dr. Rod Ferber. Thank you for listening to this episode of the COSIN Podcast. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or any of your favorite podcast apps. You can also listen to each new episode on edcircuit.com or cosin.org. Follow at cosin on Twitter for further updates.